Welcome to Syntax, a Generative Introduction, 4th edition. My name is Andrew Carney. I'm a professor of linguistics at the University of Arizona. I'm the author of your textbook, and I'll be leading you through this series of video tutorials. In the previous video, we talked about island constraints that were discovered by Hans Ross that sort of said different uh, environments out of which you cannot do WH movement. In this video, we're going to talk about an explanation for one of those island constraints, but it's an explanation uh, that can be extended to certain phenomena using DP movement and head movement as well. This is a constraint known as the minimal link con condition. Now, in some of the trees we've already drawn over, the t over time, I've actually kept saying to you, we have to do an extra little hop here, don't worry, we're going to come back and explain it. Well, this is a video where we're going to explain why you have to do those extra hops. The minimal link condition is the essential locality constraint. It says that we, when we move, we always have to move locally. And how we define locally means the closest potential position in which you could check the relevant features. So if you're doing WH movement, WH movement typically um, involves movement to specifiers of CP. So if you're going to move, you're going to move, first of all, to the closest potential place that you could check that feature, so a specifier of some CP. It doesn't actually have to be the place where you check the feature. You might move on, but it is the first potential place. And if you can't move there for some reason, you're going to result in an island. So this is going to explain how we deal with WH islands. The minimal link condition informally is move something to the closest potential landing site. There's a formal version in the textbook that you can look at. All right, so let's see how uh, sort of the implications for this. We're going to start with some grammatical sentences. So the sentence, what do you think Bill loves? The movement of what from downstairs in this position here, this trace position, is moving all the way up to the top. Now, if you were to move that in one fell swoop, this would be a violation of the minimal link condition because you're skipping this potential position in the way. So this, uh, this movement is technically not permitted by the minimal link condition. Of course, this sentence is grammatical, so we need to explain why it's grammatical. The answer to this is that you can, in fact, get this WH word into this position without violating the minimal link condition by doing the movement in two hops. So if we were to move what into the specifier of the embedded clause and then move it again up to the specifier of the higher clause, we've met the minimal link condition because we've moved to the first potential position and then we kept moving on to the next potential position, etc., until we could check the features. That's why we've been doing these extra little hops in the trees up to now is because of this minimal link condition. It would be legitimate to ask the question, is there ev any evidence that you actually stop off here in this intermediate position? Um, the answer to that is that there may be uh, some evidence from German and Malayalam that you in fact pronounce that question word in that intermediate specifier position. We also find that kids pronounce um, a, a copy at that, at that position. You'll recall from, the, uh, from two videos ago that kids often pronounce um, WH words twice, once in their uh, surface position and once in their uh, base or underlying position. Well, it turns out that they often pronounce them in these intermediate positions as well. So that's some kind of evidence. Um, there's a video that I've linked here. Again, I can't include it directly in the slideshow for copyright reasons, but you can click on this and uh, the link is down below in the description of this video and it will take you uh, to a video showing you kids um, who actually do uh, stop uh, but put uh, a question word into this intermediate position. 
It's a fascinating video. It's well worth watching. All right. Um, so let's see if we can now use the minimal link condition to explain why WH islands happen. So let's, we're going to try a couple of different ways and ordering of movements. What we're going to start with is a sentence that has two WH phrases, a who and a what, both of which are arguments of kissed. Now, um, our first attempt here is we're going to uh, move the what word into the specifier of the embedded clause. All right, that's, that movement is fine. It meets the minimal link condition, and the WH feature is checked, so that's good. But um, if we then try and move the who word into that position because of the minimal link condition, we have a problem. Something is already there. So we're, this sentence is going to result in ungrammaticality because we've tried to move the who into the first potential position, which is already occupied. So that's not going to work. Um, the specifier of this CP is already filled. That doesn't work. But you might be clever and think, well, maybe the problem here is merely the order in which you have done the operations. So let's say that instead, um, what you try and do, you move that what word into that position, is you just move it straight up to the top of the clause. Um, you can't do that. That's a violation of the minimal link condition because you've skipped this position. So that doesn't work. And here's our third try. Let's say you try and do them in a different order. So you move the who word first, and then you try and move that who word again. That's fine. But what we've done then is we've created this trace. And that trace is going to block the movement of the what. The what can't move into the trace because the, that's the, the spec of the CP is already occupied. So that isn't going to work either. So the net result of this is if you've got two WH phrases and two um, legitimate licensing points, two different specifiers of CP, there's no way to do it where you check both WH features and you meet the minimal link condition. And that's why WH islands exist. There's simply no way to derive a WH island sentence. There's no ordering of operations where you don't either have to move into an occupied position or you violate the minimal link condition. Okay, now the minimal link condition also shows up with other kinds of movement. It shows up in what's called DP movement as well. So here's the thing to remember about DP movement is that it's partly motivated by case, but it's also partly motivated by the EPP. And the EPP allows us a solution um, that involves insertion of an expletive. So uh, we have the sentence, it is likely that Mark left. We satisfy the EPP in this sentence by inserting an it into the specifier of the higher clause. Another option is to do raising, and you can do that if the embedded clause is non-finite. So mark can move into this position. Um, that uh, gets you both case and um, the EPP, so that, that works right there. Now, you can do the same thing with the verb seems. This, these exact two sentences can be replicated with the verb seems. So we have Mark seems to have left. That's a sentence with raising. Or you can say it seems that Mark has left. And the it here uh, is satisfying the EPP on the higher clause uh, via expletive insertion. Now let's see what happens if we combine a seems sentence with an is likely sentence. What we do is we've uh, created two potential positions, two specifiers of TP, that have to be satisfied um, uh, by some mechanism to get the, the, to get the EPP to work out. Um, so we have blank seems that blank is likely Mark to have left. Mark can, um, Mark, uh, can move uh, uh, into this position here. So uh, you can say, it seems that Mark is likely to have left. 
Um, and that's fine. We've, we've satisfied the EPP properties of seam with the it, and we've satisfied the case and EPP properties uh, of is likely uh, by moving mark into this position. So that's fine. But the problem is, is that you cannot do expletive insertion in the embedded clause and do um, DP movement to the higher clause. So you can do expletive insertion in the higher clause and do movement to the lower clause, but the reverse is not true. In this sentence, which is ungrammatical, Mark seems that it is likely to have left. The, you cannot have moved Mark around here into the subject position and satisfied the EPP of the embedded clause by doing expletive insertion. This last sentence, which is ungrammatical, is sometimes known as super raising because you're, you're raising past um, the subject position of this intermediate clause position. I think you might be able to see where this is going. The MLC says you must move to the first potential position where you can satisfy a requirement. So in the super raising sentence, the first potential position in which you can move mark is the specifier of, it, of is likely. And if you've inserted an expletive into this position, then mark cannot stop there. Mark cannot stop off in this position because it's occupied. So movement of mark up to this higher position passes this potential nominative position. And that's a violation of the minimal link condition. So super raising sentences are also ruled out by this constraint. It's exactly the same pattern as WH islands. You're trying to move around a position that could potentially be uh, the place where you land. Uh, it, this also shows up with head movement. So remember in French, um, you can do a subject ox inversion of main verbs. So if you're asking the yes no question, um, did you eat the apples or are you, uh, are you eating the apples, manger vous des pommes, the main verb uh, shows up here in front of the subject. This is typically a case of um, T to C movement, right? So um, this is a case where you take whatever happens to be in T. And in this case, it's the main verb because the main verb undergoes V to T movement. And then you take that element and you move it into the C and that gives you subject ox inversion. This doesn't happen in English because we don't do this first hop. Uh, we don't do V to T movement in English, but you do in French. So that's fine and dandy, but uh, uh, and uh, the same thing is true when you have an auxiliary. So if you happen to have an auxiliary in the way, um, the auxiliary is the thing that moves to T, and then that's the thing that goes to T to C movement. So you have ox um, uh, subject to order, uh, just, as, just as you do in English. So an auxiliary will move into T, and then that T will move to C, and you get avez-vous mangé de pommes. But what you cannot do is just move this um, main verb straight to the complementizer. Uh, to do so would violate the minimal link condition. You notice that we're doing two hops here. So um, let's look at that. You can't say, mangez-vous avec des pommes, right? Where you're skipping over the auxiliary that is in the tense node. So we have here, I've already done um, movement of the uh, subject into the specifier of the TP, and here we have the auxiliary, which we've moved into the T node as well. Um, when we're trying to do um, uh, movement of manger, uh, we are skipping over this tense node if we try to move it straight up to the C. So that would be a violation of the minimal link condition skipping a potential position, because something else is already there. So that explains why you can't say manger vous avez des pommes. Um, this particular constraint, this version of the minimal link con condition, is sometimes known as the head movement constraint, but it is effectively just a very narrow version of the minimal link condition. So to summarize, the minimal link condition 
uh, is an explanation for a for a variety of things. It explains WH islands. It explains why super raising is bad, and it explains why head movement constraint violations occur, can't occur. So uh, the minimal link condition says always move to the first potential position. And if you can't because something else is already there, then you're going to result in an ungrammatical sentence.